Okay, James? Text, Office of Dietary Supplements Seminar Series. ods.od.nih.governor National Institutes of Health, Office of Dietary Supplements. I'll take that as a yes. So I want to welcome everyone to today's National Institutes of Health Office of Dietary Supplements Seminar. I'm Barbara Sorkin. In addition to moderating ODS's seminars, I co-direct NIH's Consortium Advancing Research on Botanicals and Other Natural Products, our CARBON program. Before I introduce today's speaker, I have two brief announcements, really. First, coming attractions. Our next ODS webinar will be given by Dr. Sachin Panda from the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. It will be at 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time on Wednesday, December 13th. Dr. Panda's title is Circadian Rhythms and Time-Restricted Eating in Health and Disease. If you're not on our seminar's mailing list and you'd like to be, please see the chat. Icon for the chat should be at the bottom right of your screen. Um, we'll be putting an email address there that you can use to request to be added to our webinar's mailing list. And second, some webinar logistics. In the interests of audio quality um, for everyone, um, I can't forward my slides. There we go, just slow. Um, we've muted you all, and we ask that you please stay muted until the final questions and answers, unless Dr. Vanderbrook asks for discussion earlier. Um, you do have access to the chat, though. And we encourage you to put any questions you have for her in the chat as they arise. If I see any that seem urgent, I'll try to get her attention to ask them midstream. Otherwise, we'll take as many as we can fit at the end of her presentation. Please also use the chat if you're having technical problems with the webinar audio or visual or the closed captions, and one of us will try to help. Um, we do ask that everybody please be um, considerate of everyone else and professional. Text. Any opinions expressed by ODS seminar speakers or attendees do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the United States government. A photo appears, text, freshly harvested ackee fruits, blyside, containing the orange fruit pods and the white edible arrel, which is cooked in boiling water until tender. And the um, disclaimer, and a photo that Dr. Vanderbrook took as I introduce, as I have the pleasure of introducing her. Um, she will be talking about botanical use for health in the Caribbean and Mexican diasporas. But she was actually born in Belgium and did her bachelor's and um, doctoral degrees there. And then she spent um, 16 years in um, New York City in the Bronx she is currently an ethnobotanist at the University of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. She's also an honorary research associate still at the New York Botanical Garden. Um, she's also a research associate at the Missouri Botanical Garden, and she is editor-in-chief of Economic Botany, the Journal of the Society for Ethnobotany. So really, Dr. Vanderbrook brings um, an area that I think is, is rather a research gap at NIH ethnobotany to us, and quite a bit of um, breadth to our ODS seminar program, which I like. Um, last month, our seminar focused on specific flavonoids and their effects on specific aspects of health and resilience. So now we broaden out to looking at people and communities. So I think it's a nice change in, in Zoom range. Um, so. Uh, Dr. Vanderbrook's research focuses on community-based scholarship, uh, exploring the interplay between Caribbean biological and cultural diversity. So one of her research hats is focused on conservation. Uh, she's been engaged for more than 20 years in international collaborations to research interactions between communities, people, and their plants in Latin America and in the Caribbean and in their diaspora communities um, here in New York City. Uh, so her, her work focuses on the plants and the traditional and cultural beliefs and practices of these communities. One of the applications of her research that I think she's going to talk about today is developing curricular materials and training activities for healthcare providers and medical students 
to foster culturally sensitive health care, incorporating beliefs and practices. So I will say that this is very consistent with the um, President's Council of Advisors advice that um, we increase our focus on inclusivity and diversity in federal research on nutrition. So I'm really excited. Um, I think you're going to, oh, and I need to, one more thing that I want to do is congratulate Dr. Vanderbrook on a paper um, that just came out in um, Trends in Ecology and Evolution today. So I just wanted to share that. And now I will finally stop sharing and give you the microphone. An article appears with the title, Fostering Greater Recognition of Caribbean Traditional Plant Knowledge. So I'm um, really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, um, Barbara, for the cheers. Let me pull up my presentation, start sharing my screen. Are you seeing my screen? screen share no actually not yet you want to give it a minute see it now you got oh, it okay thank you very much uh, if it's okay with the audience i will turn off my video camera during the presentation just to preserve bandwidth text botanical use for health in the caribbean and mexican diasporas ina van de Bruyck, phd the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. Ina.Vanderbroek at uwimona.edu. Okay, thank you very much for the cheers also, Dr. Sorkin, and, and for inviting me um, to speak at your seminar series. It's really an honor to be here. And today I will be presenting um, on a large ethnobotany survey, uh, collaborating with four Caribbean and our uh, Latino communities in New York City uh, about their use and knowledge of plants as medicines. And I, as you said, I was involved for 16 years um, in New York City working at the New York Botanical Garden before I moved to Jamaica to uh, work at the University of the West Indies. So in 2017, 2018, we did this large survey but um, I also want to point out that uh, this field of urban ethnobotany or urban ethnomedicine really looking at the relationships between people and culture, communities, and their use of plants as medicines, um, that this has been spearheaded by my former boss at the New York Botanical Garden. Dr. Michael Balick in the late 1990s. So, so it, it, it has been a long time coming and, and I hope to make you enthusiastic by giving this presentation also. Before I dive into the project and its results, I first wanna go over with you um, to define what a medicinal plant is, what a botanical or medicinal plant is in the context of uh, communities, diaspora communities in New York City using these plants. So it's any plant that is used raw or unprocessed to prevent or to treat um, ill health and discomfort. And this can be uh, physical, health conditions, but also mental health or spiritual uh, illnesses. This very much includes plants that have a major role as foods and that have a double role as medicines. And I really want to um, draw your attention to this because you will see during my presentation that these food medicines um, are very important for the four communities that we collaborate with. Although we're speaking about cultural knowledge, so traditional knowledge, and it's rooted in, in, in those traditions from the past, this does not mean that this knowledge is outdated. It's very much active, um, dynamic. It is adapting to current epidemiological um, context. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
Caribbean and Latino communities uh, started to accelerate their sharing of knowledge about medicinal plants to treat COVID. So as such, it belongs to the cultural heritage of these communities. And this comes with uh, intellectual property rights. Two perspectives appear as diagrams, the emic and the edic. I also want to provide a definition of traditional medicine. So traditional medicine is place-based and contextual. It is part of the worldview of a, com a community. So it's, it's rooted in culture and tradition, and it is driven by cultural perceptions, beliefs, and experiences. So we're talking about the emic perspective. The emic perspective is the insider's point of view, from the point of view of a community member. If we're looking at um, biomedicine or mainstream medicine, pharmaceutical medicine, whatever uh, term we want to use to describe it, then we are looking um, from an outside, uh, outsider's point of view, are taking an ethic perspective. Indeed, this biomedicine or pharmaceutical medicine is based on academic consensus. It, 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 its claim is to be universal and to be built around hypothesis testing and uh, theory formation and external observations. So traditional medicine in New York City exists side by side with biomedicine. So here you see a picture of a botanica shop and there are literally hundreds of them all throughout the city. These are uh, shops operated um, by Caribbean and Latino staff who sell plants and products for physical healing, for spiritual healing. Um, and it's a place where community members come together and discuss their health concern. And this picture, this picture was taken by uh, Brian Hockaday, who, who has been working with me in this project, is it, so beautiful in that it shows that uh, these two healthcare systems, the biomedical system and the traditional medical system exists, exist in parallel in New York City. From the literature, we also know that there is um, a use rate of plant medicines by um, diaspora, Caribbean and Latino communities throughout the US, uh, that there is a use rate that can be up to 90%. So that's quite significant. And that is a reason why these botanica stores exist. There are several reasons why people, when they migrate to New York City, uh, may prefer to continue using uh, their botanicals and their um, consultations with traditional healers or go to botanica stores. First and foremost is because they grew up in the cultural tradition and they have strong beliefs about it. Other reasons are uh, difficulties accessing healthcare or language barriers. So you can see here in this slide uh, two other pictures of another Botanica store and it's a dear collaborator we have been working with for a long time, Mr. Don Eliseo. Um, he, you see a picture of him on the outside of the botanica and all the plants that are there. And then the inside, he's showing the same plant species, which is Pitiviria aliasi. It's called guinea henweed in English or anamu in Spanish. And in his one hand, he has uh, the dried version of it uh, that is packaged. And in his uh, other hand, he has the fresh uh, guinea henweed. Next, top 10 foreign-born communities in NYC. A table depicts nationality and population size from a 2015 survey. So the four communities we collaborated with all belong to the top 10 of the foreign-born or out born outside the mainland uh, US in New York City. These are people born in the Dominican Republic, Mexico, or Jamaica. And then also uh, the Puerto Ricans are not uh, on this list uh, of the 2015 American Community Survey because they're not they're, they're U.S. citizens, but they were born outside the mainland uh, U.S. Together, these four communities represent one in four people 
uh, of foreign born or born outside the mainland uh, US New Yorkers. So in order to um, you know, have a short way of talking about this, this program, uh, we use the acronym CARLO E2. And of course, CARLO can be CARLA, CARLIX, um, Caribbean and Latino Ethnobotany and Ethnomedicine. So referring to people and plants and traditional medicine. And, and really want to specify here, it's working with uh, people from Dominican Republic, Mexico, Jamaica, or Puerto Rico. Text, 2017 to 2018 survey in New York City. So here you see uh, a map of New York City with the five boroughs and uh, where these communities reside. So we interviewed in total um, in 2017, 2000, 2018, we did our ethnobotanical survey in New York City, and we interviewed 400 people. Uh, for each community, uh, we interviewed 100 people who are aged 18 or older, born outside the mainland USA, and they consented to uh, participating in an in, in interview. So we got uh, RB approval for this. One of the other things that we asked um, in the uh, screening questions was if they knew of any plans uh, and were, of course, willing to talk about them that they used for their healthcare. Before we started this um, program, we knew that there are a large gap in our scientific knowledge about the breadth, so the range of plants that are used as medicines. Uh, they're uh, lacking information on their scientific plant names because people know these plants by their common names, their vernacular names, and you can see a picture on the right-hand side of uh, Miss, uh, Michelle Dominguez holding a leaf of insulina. You can probably guess what this plant is used for, right? Indeed, to treat diabetes. Um, but it would take an ethnobotany project to then identify this plant to a botanical species name. So then we know it's a, a, a species of the genus Costus uh, belonging to the plant family Costaceae, which is very closely related to the ginger family. Once we know that botanical name, we can then do literature searches on the known efficacy of uh, the species and its safety of use. There are also large gaps in information about that. Um, so other gaps um, relate to cultural health beliefs and practices and the modalities of plant use by these communities. Text, methodology, free listing of plant remedies. Plant use reports transcribed, coded, and tallied for each community. A table appears below with plant species and their treatments. So here's, um, this slide gives you some insight into the methodology. We did our uh, 400 in-person interviews, either in English or in Spanish. Um, and this gave us almost 13,000 plant use reports. And this referred after botanical identification, this was linked to 527 botanicals or plant species in total. So a plant use report is the first row that you see here on this uh, spreadsheet. That is one plant use report. And of course, uh, we did not uh, note down people's names, so they got a code. Um, and what you see on this screenshot that I took here is um, a plant uh, mentioned by several people that is called Ceraci. Uh, Carella or bitter melon, and this is only from our 100 interviews with uh, Jamaicans living in New York City. But um, when we interviewed Dominicans and Puerto Ricans, they know the species as Cunde Amor. Cunde Amor. So um, uh, an ethnobotanist is a little bit of a plant detective, a Sherlock Holmes, who then, you know, um, connects these local or vernacular names with their scientific names. Other information that we uh, recorded was the plant part used, the illness treated, the preparation, and the administration. Two images of yellow flowers appear. Why should we worry about authenticating plant medicines? Well, here's why. 
um, a species known by the name dandelion or in Spanish diente de león. Many of us will know that as um, Taraxacum officinale, right? And it's available in our supermarket because the leaves are slightly bitter and edible. And you see a picture here on the left hand side. It belongs to the sun sunflower family. This is when what uh, Puerto Ricans, Jamaicans, Mexicans uh, refer to this particular species when they're talking about diente de leon or dandelion. Now, when Jamaicans talk about dandelion, it's a very different species. And that's the one you see on the right hand side. It's a legume belonging to the Fabaceae. It's Senna occidentalis. So it's not only a different species, it belongs to very different botanical families. So it's very important to unambiguously cross link these common names, these vernacular names with their scientific or botanical names. Two search results from a medical website appear totally left of a cactus-like plant. Because, let's say you want to find out something about the safety of a plant, and we have here this cactus that's called tuna, known by the four communities we work with. They know it all as tuna. There's not much variation in the common name. But let's say you go to PubMed and you do tuna and toxicity. What you get is information on heavy metal toxicity in fish, in, in tuna fish, right? Um, so if you know, if you have done, gone through the process of botanically authenticating the species, you know it is Opuntia cochinilifera. Uh, it has a synonym, botanical synonym, being Nopalea cochinilifera. And if you search for that in PubMed, you will be able to pull up uh, a small clinical trial where a juice of this cactus was given to patients and um, there was some uh, lowering of blood glucose levels. So using its scientific name, you will be able to pull up that information. Text, our research methodology, plant ID. So here's an overview of our uh, plant authentication. After our interviews, we got a long list of those common names. We rank them because based on their frequency of mention, certain plants will be more commonly mentioned than others, will be more popular. Then we went to botanica stores, green grocers, supermarkets, purchased plant samples and identified them using botanical keys and consultation of, of botanists and also a consultation of herbaria. And at the New York Botanical Garden, there is a large herbarium with um, millions of um, specimens. And this is a really valuable resource to uh, compare identifications. Text, Carlo Medicinal Plant Knowledge is Diverse. A bar chart depicts the total number of plants named by the percent of community reporting. So let's have a look at our results now. Um, and and this, this really, um, was not what we expected. Um, but each community of 100 people who we interviewed mentioned uh, more than 200 different botanicals. Um, and you know, this, this is New York City, right? So this shows these plants are very important to people and they have ways of obtaining them from their home, home countries, not in the least through the commercial circuit of botanicas and then others, as you will see, the foods that are used as medicines are commonly available in, in supermarkets. What this slide also shows you is that the majority of these plant species are reported by less than five people. So more than 100 plants in each of these cases so this is what the percentages show you, the percentages of plants that are reported by only five people. The ones with the darker col colors uh, at the top are those reported by more than 20 people, more than 20% uh, of each uh, community. A colored Venn diagram overlaps the Mexicans, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, and Jamaicans. The number at the center reads 87, 17%. So the next question that we asked ourselves is, 
how much overlap is there, is there, does there exist in this um, long list of 527 uh, plant species of botanicals? And we found that only 87 species, or 17% of the species total, was reported by these four communities, Mexicans, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, and Jamaicans. And um, the pictures below show, show some of these popular shared species. It will probably directly um, strike you that uh, four of them are foods. And indeed, um, nearly three in four of those 87 species um, are food medicines. And these 87 species represent three quarters of all use reports. People reporting using plant A to treat health condition, X. A new Venn diagram overlaps medicine and food. So foods are important medicines, and, and, and I will be talking about food medicines. But what do I mean with that? So um, the distinction, distinction between foods and medicines is really on a continuum. If we look um, at the far right, where you have the foods, foods are consumed regularly, um, consumed without specific health concerns, and the parts that are consumed are edible. They tend to be less bitter in general, so I'm generalizing here. Knowledge about them is commonly shared, and often they are generally regarded as safe. On the opposite end of the specter spectrum are plants that are only used as medicines. They are taken when, when uh, someone feels ill. Um, they are commonly used to treat specific health problems or to prevent spe specific health problems. Their parts may be edible or inedible, and they tend to be, in general, more bitter. Knowledge about them um, is held in the specialist domain, and there is um, usually a dose-effect relationship. So if you uh, consume more, there is a stronger effect. The food medicines now are in the middle. So this um, is represented by the traditional food remedies that I will be talking about, uh, the healthy foods without any specific um, general health, um, um, pinpointing any health condition, uh, the ones that you would call food sub supplement, for example, eating beets to improve your iron levels in your blood, but also the morning teas. Morning teas can be uh, drunk because they're um, an agreeable beverage, but also to expel intestinal gases, for example. And many of the condiments and spices, like this Caribbean oregano, which again is uh, very different from the Mediterranean oregano, uh, also belongs uh, in this a category in between category of food medicines. A bar chart appears. So food medicines are really important for those uh, four communities. And this is the average numbers of plants that people in um, these four communities reported um, and then categorized uh, whether they were food medicines or plants that uh, exclusively were used as medicines. Um, key takeaway points are that people reported as many, if not more, food medicines than, than um, only medicinal plants, and that Dominicans um, are the ones that uh, on average reported the most uh, number of uh, food medicines compared to the other communities. A ranking of health conditions appear with stomach ache and indigestion as number one. Foods were also um, the main treatments, the majority of the treatments reported um, for eight of the top 10 illnesses that were treated with plants. So here you see a ranking of health conditions based on these use reports every time that a person said, I'm using a plant to treat this type of illness. And on the right hand side, you see uh, whether the treatment was a food medicine or a plant that was only used medicinally. So you see that in, in all the cases, the majority 
of these health conditions are treated with uh, food medicines, with the exception of stress and nervousness and uh, wounds and burns. The next question was, are these same food medicines um, used for the same conditions across these four communities? And the answer there is not always. Um, if we look at lime and lemon, yes, there is a universal use of lime and lemon to treat the common cold. Um, by these four communities, but and, and here we are comparing the top uses that people were mentioning. If we look at, for example, garlic, um, the three Caribbean communities used garlic uh, um, predominantly to treat hypertension, while in the Mexican com community, the most prevalent use was to treat um, the cough. And you can see for the other uh, important food food medicines, these food plants were named by at least uh, 20 people during interviews in, in, in these communities. You can see that for these other food medicines, popular food medicines, um, there were differences as well. So sometimes a food medicine is used across um, communities, but often it is not. Text. Some Carlo food medicines may have confounding common names. One must also be very careful to not to uh, transpose our own cultural understanding of plants, a common plants, common food plants such as oregano, or pear, or cherry and assume that is that it will be the species that we know. Like I already said, the oregano used by uh, Caribbean communities is the Caribbean oregano, Lipia micromera. It's not the um, Mediterranean oregano. When Jamaicans talk about pear, they mean avocado. When um, Caribbean people talk about cereza, which means cherry. They're talking about the acerola cherry, not the cherry that we commonly use in North America. When Jamaicans talk about pine, they mean pineapple. So again, very important to do your correct botanical authentication. And um, I also put up this slide because I wanted to show you that for some of these food medicines with confounding common names, there, definitely, there is definitely a data deficiency um, when we look at their efficacy or their safety of use. Images of avocados and coffee plants appear. Food medicines can also be used in rather uncommon ways. So if someone says, I'm using the avocado fruit, um, they may be eating the fruit, but it's also possible, and, and six Dominicans told us uh, that they mentioned ingesting or making an infusion of avocado seeds that they had grounded. So um, this was used to treat diabetes. So grate the seed and make it as a tea. Eight Puerto Ricans reported using coffee as uh, eye drops are putting coffee grounds directly in the eye. So again, this shows you there is great diversity in the use of botanicals, either in the plant part that is used, in the preparation method, in the way it is administrated, and I have left out the elephant in the room if you guess, you might think what it is. That elephant in the room is the dosage, right? And uh, actually we stopped recording the dosage because if you interview 100 people, 100 people have different dosages. Text, diverse use, plant parts, or preparation methods. Again, uh, showing that diversity of use, diversity of plant part use, and diversity of um, preparation or administration method. I'm going to pick out one 
the Guinea Henweed or the Anamu, which is Pitiviria aliaceae. In New York City, uh, Jamaicans um, will drink uh, a leaf of the, a tea, sorry, a tea of the leaves uh, to treat cancer. This is the most frequently reported use there, whereas the most frequently reported use for Dominicans is to make a tincture of the roots to treat joint pain or arthritis. And if you look at the other species, again, there are very clear cultural differences in how the species is used and for what it is used. Text, Carlo Cultural Health Beliefs and Attitudes. So the second half of my talk will be about uh, cultural beliefs and attitudes in these communities because these cultural beliefs and attitudes are what drives people's use uh, of medicinal plants. Text, reasons for using medicinal plants. The first question was asking people why uh, they were using medicinal plants. And originally we had thought that existing health barriers would be um, the most common reason, but it turned out to be um, that people focused very much on the fact that they perceived plants to be safer and especially that they have uh, fewer side effects. Also the fact that these plants are natural, considered natural and healthy and um, perceived as effective. So the perceived health benefits of those botanicals was the most important reason. Followed, and that was followed by cultural factor. Um, the fact that is uh, part of their tradition, that it's recommended by the community and that people have faith in these herbal remedies. We also asked people uh, reasons for using pharmaceuticals. And then the necessity, uh, the need-based reason, if, if herbal remedies do not really work or if they are unavailable, because um, even though we recorded more than 200 plant species, um, there sometimes people would have a preference for using still other plant species that are only available in their countries of origin. And another very important reason was uh, when their doctor prescribed pharmaceuticals that they would um, use them. And the third uh, is that uh, when their illnesses are serious, uh, especially in cases of injury or infections, and when people have pain. So you have necessity, perceived health benefits, and doctor recommendation that are very strongly associated with using pharmaceuticals. Text, trust in botanicals versus pharmaceuticals. This was pretty eye-opening to us. Um, trust in um, botanicals in medicinal plants versus pharmaceuticals. Nine in 10 people, at least in each of the four communities, um, confirmed that they have confidence in the healing power of plants. But when you look at their confidence in the healing power of pharmaceuticals, uh, you see the pills the, that we have and, and the the colors that measure the confidence, you could see that confidence was lowest among Jamaicans, 36%, uh, and ranging uh, across these communities and the highest among uh, the Mexican community with 65%. And, and so there were significant differences by community in people's confidence um, in pharmaceuticals specifically. Text concerns about combining medicinal plants and pharmaceuticals. We also saw um, cross-cultural differences in um, people's agreement that if you combine medicinal plants with pharmaceutical products, that uh, it heals, that it provides an additional strength, that in it increases the healing power of both. Um, the uh, Mexican, uh, Dominican, and Puerto Rican community uh, was in agreement. The majority of people agreed with this, and Jamaicans uh, stood out by um, saying they did not agree with this. 
all communities agreed, however, that combining both can be harmful for uh, a person's health. So I think here providers have an opportunity to talk with their patients. And, and you'll see that in my next slides um, as well, that um, uh, many of the results that of our um, program are showing that actually um, community members are, are ready to work together with providers and develop a, a treatment plan that is mutually acceptable. Text, the healthcare seeking process. A flowchart appears with steps, one, establish diagnosis, two, try plant remedies first, three, try pharmaceuticals if necessary, four, select course, alternate, or combine. So let's have a look at the healthcare seeking uh, process. And, and, and there are healthcare seeking models, uh, and we have uh, fit our results into here to, to slightly adapt them. And, and the story that they tell of the four communities uh, that we collaborated with is that people will first establish a diagnosis by either consulting the biomedical system, so going to their doctor or going to their community clinic or, or going to the emergency room. Um, another way of establishing diagnosis is to uh, talk with their community, um, with the people closest to them. So establishing diagnosis um, when the health condition is not serious or people are familiar with the Ill illness, they will try plant remedies first. And this is because um, botanicals are perceived to have milder effects and um, have a, a lower risk. Also, the use of, of botanicals is embedded within this cultural uh, identity, cultural traditions, social relationships, and being familiar with these remedies. On the other hand, when the illnesses are perceived or considered very serious, our medicinal plants do not work. Um, Carlo community members will try pharmaceuticals. So they will try them if necessary and if they are able. And here, barriers, access barriers, our cultural barriers, our language barriers, our financial barriers are very important. And also, um, people's worry about side effects. So during interviews, people were very worried about uh, pharmaceuticals being something that can hide symptoms, but does not really cure a disease. So based on all these individual and community assessments, people will select the treatment that is most appropriate for them, and they may alternate course or they may combine uh, pharmaceuticals and medicinal plants but the end goal that they have is to maximize efficacy and to minimize risk and again here is a point of commonality between patients and providers because exactly this is what providers want as well text take note Many Carlo patients consider a doctor's visit to be a means to diagnosis and just one perspective on treatment. Never assume that silence is compliance. So a couple notes here. Um, many Caribbean and Latino patients consider going to a doctor as a means to get diagnosis and not a commitment to following uh, the therapy, the treatment. So, and here are a few quotes from people um, I will um, take the first one. Uh, a Jamaican lady, 16, 61 years old, said, I would go and get the diagnosis, but I'm not taking no medication. No, I treat myself. A Puerto Rican lady, uh, age 54, said, I have a primary care doctor, but I just check in with them. I do my own research too, and I don't usually follow doctor's orders. So when a patient is silent, that does not necessarily mean that after the diagnosis that they will um, comply with treatment. Text, Carlo patients may have culturally informed understandings of the relationship between illness symptoms and treatments. However, these needn't work in opposition to biomedical treatment. 
It's also important to familiarize yourself if you're a healthcare provider with culturally informed understandings of um, disease and why a disease is treated. For example, in the case of high blood sugar, people say your blood is sweet and um, so you have to use something bitter, you have to cleanse your blood. If you are not aware of these cultural beliefs, then this will um, certainly affect your treatment plan. Text. Patients may alternate treatments depending on context. Be sure to communicate with car low patients about recent and upcoming travel. Patients may alternate alternate treatments depending on the right context. So it's important to ask people about their recent or upcoming travel because several people told us, um, well, I'm now in New York City, I have uh, my medication, so I'm taking them, but when I go home, I'm, I'm using my, my plant medicines there, or um, I, I don't have access to my um, pharmaceuticals anymore when I'm in my country, and thus I will uh, switch and take um, plant medicines instead. Text. When patients perceive their doctor to have a negative attitude toward herbal remedies, communication often breaks down. What is very, very, very important is that when patients perceive that their healthcare provider has a negative attitude towards their use of herbal remedies, then they often tend to stay silent. So um, a Mexican man uh, 73 years old said, I don't even tell the doctor that I'm using the plants because they often tell you they're no good. A, Domin a Dominican lady said, doctors don't believe in medicinal plants, so I just don't tell them. A Jamaican man said, they're not going to allow you to use those here, man. You go to the doctor and you tell them that you use bush, and bush here stands for uh, botanicals. Text. Promoting dialogue with health providers. So because we have this large data set, we thought uh, one way of contributing to improving the clinical uh, provider space would be to develop curricular materials and training um, activities with medical students and providers in New York City. Um, so so the, the aim of those would be to you know, facilitate this, this communication between patient on the one hand and provider on the other hand, um, so that there would be more trust, mutual respect, uh, increased understanding, cultural sensitivity and awareness, and that patients would want to open up to their uh, provider about their use of botanicals or medicinal plants. Images mark modules. In the center, Module 1 appears with the title, Intro to Core Concepts of Carlo E2 Research. So under development are this curricular curriculum with uh, 10 modules and several mini modules. Uh, we have a modules on botanicas in New York City. We have a module on uh, plant monographs, highlighting uh, particular plants, uh, their, their prevalent uses, but also their um, literature information on, on their efficacy and on their safety of use and so forth. We have a module on health conditions that are popularly treated with medicinal plants. We have a mini module on the importance of plant identification. Uh, we have a mini module on how Caribbean and Latino communities talk about, discuss, um, health, disease, and illness, including their use of botanicals and so forth. And uh, one of my graduate students, Ella Vardaman, is also will also be working on contributing a module on her work with the Haitian community in New York City and uh, plants used for women's health. Text 2008 to 2018: Training medical students and physicians. Physicians, medical residents, students, pre-meds, dietetic practitioners, from hospitals, ERs, community clinics, family health centers, or independent practitioners. So between 
2008 and 2018, we held um, we held um, training activities with um, several, uh, a few, I think in total, it's going up to 50 something, 50 different training activities. And in total, we trained more than 1,200 trainees. And this included uh, pre-med students, medical students, residents, practicing physicians, dietetic practitioners, and, and these were associated, these people were associated with hospitals, emergency rooms, community clinics, family health centers, or they were independent practitioners. What we did was a variety of presentations, PowerPoint presentations, but also more hands-on things like patient mock interviews, we presented case scenarios and role play exercises. We gave classes in what we called ethnomedical Spanish, um, the way uh, Caribbean Spanish speaking people talk about health, disease, and illness. We gave one on one trainings for interns while they were interning in community clinics. Text, training activities with medical students and physicians, PowerPoint presentations, patient mock interviews case scenarios, classes in ethnomedical Spanish, one-on-one -on -one training for interns in community clinics, tours of tropical plants in Nib Conservatory, guided botanica tours. We gave them tours of the living tropical plant collection at the New York Botanical Garden, and we gave uh, them guided botanica tours. Text, training self-survey instrument, 12 questions. After training, we would ask um, the group of trainees, so it was always working with uh, groups of uh, 20 people or more, unless we did training exercises online, we asked them to fill out anonymously a self-survey instrument. And we had four questions that related to their cultural knowledge about Caribbean and Latino ethnobotany and ethnomedicine and people's use of plants as medicines, we had four questions about attitudes, and we had four questions about skills. And here you see the first uh, set of questions. Um, I'll read one. I can list reasons why Caribbean and Latino communities in the U.S. use medicinal plants, and I can name a culturally important medicinal plant for these communities. We asked people to self-rate themselves before training and after training, with one being the lowest rating and five being the highest rating. These are the four questions um, in purple about their attitudes. Uh, one of them, I'm committed to asking my patients questions about their use of medicinal plants. And then we had four questions pertaining to their skills. The last question was, I can develop a treatment plan that is mutually acceptable to my patient and myself. Text, scores. Emergency medicine physicians and residents from Metropolitan and Bellevue Hospitals, toxicology fellows from NYC Poison Control Center, and medical students from NY Medical College. A bar chart appears with average cultural competency scores. And here are the scores of one such um, training exercise with a diverse group of 19 um, students, um, toxicity fellows from the New York City Poison Control Center and emergency room physicians. And you see the fields of learning, knowledge, attitudes, and skills, and their average cultural competency score ranking from one to five, five being the highest. And you see their scores before training in blue and after training in purple. Um, in this case, and this was a whole day, this, these were PowerPoint presentations, these were um, role play uh, case scenarios, and these were um, a guided visit to the living tropical plant collection at the New York Botanical Garden, really talking about these plants, how they are used, uh, what is known about their efficacy and safety. And in this case, you see before and after, in, in all the fields, there is a, a, a significant increase. However, in, during most, um, for most training groups, 
it was knowledge and attitudes that would significantly increase after training and mostly not skills. And, and, and this seems logical, right? If, if, if it's a group that is not really, that's, that's for the first time exposed uh, to Caribbean and Latino use of botanicals. And, and one of the open questions also remains is how will these scores, if you would uh, do this, this, this survey again uh, a year later, how would these scores have um, evolved? Text, acknowledgements. Carlo slash A slash X collaborators in NYC. Dr. Michael Balick, New York Botanical Garden. Professor Dr. Edward Kennelly, CUNY Lehman College. Institute of Economic Botany, New York Botanical Garden. Brian Hockaday. Ella Vardman, NCCIH ODS grantee. Email, ina.vendabruek at uwimona.edu.jm. So with that being said, I'm at 44 minutes, and um, I want to end the presentation here and, and invite some questions. But before I do that, I really want to thank um, all our collaborators from the communities, um, without them for their time and graciously sharing their knowledge with us. Our network of um, Botanica collaborators and specifically Mr. Eliseo Trinidad for, with whom I've, I've been working for 16 years and who, who's become a friend, right? It takes a village to uh, run a program like that. And I also want to give a shout out to NIH and CAM because um, Dr. Michael Balik from the New York Botanical Garden brought me from Belgium to New York as a postdoc to work on uh, this R2021 uh, grant, at that time uh, collaborating with the community of uh, Dominican community, so immigrants from the Dominican Republic in New York City. So uh, also a big thank you to my um, collaborator, Professor Canelli from uh, City University of New York, uh, all our funders, and last but not least, um, the young people, the next generation who, who, are, who are stepping into our footsteps and, and carrying this work uh, forward, and also being NIH uh, grant awardees themselves. Thank you, thank you very much for listening as well. The presentation closes. Thank, thank you for that fabulous presentation, Ina. And we do have questions. So um, let me start with one from um, one of our wonderful um, ODS Carbon Awardees, Dr. Amala Somyanath, who I think you know a little bit, Ina. And she, Amala, would you like to, to unmic and ask the question yourself, or would you like me to ask it for you? Oh, sure. Thank you very much, Barbara. And thank you so much uh, for this wonderful presentation. Um, my, my question uh, concerned the gender or sex of the people who are involved in your survey. Uh, I was wondering if uh, what you observed about, I mean, what was the split uh, between uh, men and women in the people that you interviewed? And also, did you see any differences in, well, uh, sex or gender-based differences in how much people knew about these herbal uh, medicines and also what they were, how, how they were used or whether they were used more by men than women, et cetera. That's a wonderful question, uh, Dr. Amala. Um, yes, so I didn't have time. I really had to make a selection for my presentation, which was the most difficult thing. Um, but we really went out to do the 50-50 gender divide in each uh, of our 100 interviews. And yes, there are definitely uh, gender-based differences in traditional knowledge, especially when it comes to these foods being mm -hmm. used as medicines, especially in, in, in that category of plants. Knowledge are uh, women are the knowledge bearers of those foods as, as medicines, not unsurprisingly, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> hmm. Well, thank you. That thank you again for that answer, and thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Okay, I'm grabbing questions from the chat as I can find them. They are coming in very fast, and we're almost at the hour. So we have one here from. 
Paul Altafer, apologies if I mispronounced the last name, um, thanks you for the amazing work. Um, and he's, he's happy that these are helping to maintain indigenous um, communities and knowledge. Um, okay, so I don't think I see a question there. Um, Paul, please feel free to unmike if you. Um, I, I guess the question is, uh, the, these, uh, these programs are amazing in restoring uh, uh, cultural knowledge in uh, urban communities. I'm wondering if there's something similar happening for uh, indigenous and rural communities. Yes, so before I came to New York City, um, I worked in uh, Bolivia for several years, really working with indigenous communities and their knowledge uh, and use of medicinal plants. Um, so, so you're welcome to um, look, look at some publications that we got from there, but um, Definitely, one of the publications that we that we did was looking at people's uh, use of medicinal plants versus pharmaceuticals based on their isolation, and this was with indigenous communities in Bolivia. And it, uh, a, 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 a national park, um, but also an indigenous territory. And what we really saw is that the more people are isolated, the more they are reliant on medicinal plants. So they're their, their use of pharmaceuticals goes down and their, their use of, of medicinal plants go, goes up, really uh, based on a need. And um, in, in many places around the world, this is still the case, whether people are indigenous or not, whenever communities are isolated, plants is what they rely on. And, and isolated there cannot necessarily be in terms of geographic location, but economic or, or linguistic or um, absolutely, absolutely. Legal status. We yes. are at the hour. Ina, I don't want to impose on your time if you have time to stay on. We have many wonderful questions asked by many wonderful colleagues, but I don't want to impose. We asked you for so much time already. No, I'm happy to stay on for those who still want to discuss their We questions. have the Zoom then. Let me take a question from my NIH colleague, Charlotte Pratt. And Charlotte asks again, um, loves the presentation. Um, do you know whether people were using the botanicals as substitutes for medication? She's at NHLBI, I believe, and is concerned about um, substituting um, garlic for blood pressure medications. Are people, to your knowledge, I, I think you said that people are doing that. People are absolutely doing that. Um, and and, and I, so the whole purpose of our project is if people are not um, communicating their use of garlic to their healthcare providers for whatever reason, and healthcare providers are not aware because they're not uh, following the results of ethnobotany research or no ethnobotany research has been funded and is going on, then there is this disconnect and there is a missed opportunity for, for communication. Um, and, and, and please don't think, because I, I saw this during the training exercises a lot, that um, residents in training, but also practicing physicians were very concerned about initiating this dialogue with their patients, uh, mostly because they don't know about the efficacy and they don't know about the safety. So they, they are not familiar with these botanical remedies. And that's why they say, Let's not touch this sticky subject. But patients do not expect their physicians to know it all. So I think if you open that uh, dialogue, there may be an opportunity there for you uh, who, who knows about the uh, side effects of garlic to talk with your patients about this and to say, frankly, for other um, uh, botanicals that you do not know about to say that and to to say but I, I would love to you know learn more and look this up and then discuss with you but if you're feeling any side effects please come to me and 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 we'll we'll uh, adapt the treatment plan great answers and the questions are pouring in there's a hand raised by my ODS colleague dr. Laverne Brown dr. Brown would you like to unmike and ask it Sure, uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I have, it, it was 
I have a question that's really aligned with what you just mentioned. The communication between the patient who is using these traditional remedies and the healthcare provider is limited. And it's because of what you said, the healthcare provider, number one, may not be familiar with the, with the traditional use, but number two, even when they go and search for the evidence of efficacy or safety, oftentimes the studies are not aligned with the way the traditional folks are using uh, the botanicals, right? So oftentimes the study, so what we know about garlic might not be, uh, might the investigation or the, the study of garlic may not have been aligned with the way the, the, the patients are using the garlic, right? And so uh, we don't have the evidence, the, the healthcare providers don't have the evidence in order to have a, a real conversation with the patients. And I was just wondering, what was your answer to that? How are you planning to address it? So as you go on training the healthcare providers about you know, more cultural competency, um, it's one thing to be familiar with the fact that their patients might be using these botanical remedies, but it's another thing to be sympathetic with their desire to use these remedies and, and not want to say, oh no, the evidence suggests this, that, or the other, you shouldn't be using it because that's the reason there's a lack of communication. I, I'm just wondering, how is your training program addressing this issue? And that's great because that aligns with the question we had about what we know about efficacy. So th this is the sticky point that comes up again and again, right? Um, the, the issue is, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter what the provider thinks, it matters what the patient thinks, because the patient is going to respond accordingly. Um, but patients do appreciate um, that healthcare providers say, um, have this open dialogue in which they say, look, I'm, tr I'm trained in biomedicine, um, I currently, I feel there is lacking evidence, especially about the way um, the community is using these plants. And I don't know, I honestly don't know what uh, the effect of that is. So I would like you to, to ask you, if you continue using this botanical, that you are in, uh, contact me immediately when you notice uh, some issue with your body. That, that I, I think, because if you're going to shut down the patient, the patient is going to continue either way. They, they, they've already made up their mind. They're not really looking for the approval of the doctor, but they, I think, are open, and I'm generalizing here, right? They, they, based on the feeling uh, that, and this is so, so hard to say in an NIH webinar, but something that, that came, if you do a qualitative analysis that floats on the top is that patients are open to talk about it if they don't feel, and I put, I'm putting it extreme, scolded, are discouraged by their healthcare provider. If a provider says, this does not align with my treatment, it's difficult for me to endorse this, but I understand this is important for you, but whenever you feel it's not working or it's giving you some side effects, contact me immediately. I'm here for you. This is a relationship of trust. So it's all about that relationship of trust. So re respect and trust have to be a two-way street or it doesn't work. Yeah. Right. Um, so there are a couple of questions that I think you'll really be able to speak to about sourcing um, and, you know, is it important how these plants are grown and what is the concern in terms of conserving the plants? Absolutely. Uh, that's, a, that's a whole other side angle of this project as well. Um, in some botanica shops in New York City, I encountered Melocactus lemeri, which is an endemic cactus from the Caribbean. Endemic means it grows only there and nowhere else in the world. Uh, it was sold at $80 a piece. So these are very slow growing plants that if, if they are this size, that means they're probably 100, if not a couple of hundred years old. 
and those were sold because you know they're culturally important um, customs checks for these but they get in um, yeah so there is this concern for endemic species um, that, that, that the way they are sourced that they may be um, over exploited that, that there is a conservation angle to this project as well and we, and data we, deficient. Everything is data deficient. That does, if, if that's my take home message to you, we need more research and we really need, it takes a village, right? Uh, from funders to uh, ethnobotanists and trainees and graduate students and different angles, especially in today's world. There's a question from Magnus about the ages of the people who have participated in this survey and about the extent to which this knowledge is being transferred down to um, the generations who were perhaps born in this in the mainland U.S. and are spending more of their time in the mainland than back home wherever, or you know, back in in Latin America. Um, and I, I know that some of Michael Balick's work has been on the idea that if you lose the plants through lack of conservation or over exploitation, you lose the knowledge with the plants. So two, two things that, one is my question and the, the first one is a question in the chat. So we have, um, we have some data on that for the Dominican community. What we saw is um, these food medicines, right? That are popularly available in Latino green, green grocers in New York City, also in supermarkets in, in Caribbean or Latino neighborhoods. Uh, young people, young Dominicans had as much knowledge about those as uh, older Dominicans. So there was no age knowledge correlation. But if you talk about those plants that are only used uh, as medicines, yes, there was a clear knowledge correlation with younger people knowing less. And, and, and this study was uh, done with all first generation immigrants. Um, we have not followed up on looking at the generations that were born here. This is, I uh, hypothesize that the real disconnect may be in that generation. So definitely um, knowledge loss, but the good message is, and, and we, we published that in uh, PLOS1, uh, challenging the paradigm, that knowledge about foods as medicine, right? So this is a common topic in, in my Caribbean and Latino uh, research in New York City, with, working with the diaspora and allies find, and finding that as well in her work with the Haitian community and women's health, food medicines. Uh, knowledge about foods is preserved in the next generation. And we have a comment from Maria Monagas. Maria, can you unmic and would you like to say it yourself? Yeah, this is a fantastic discussion. And what I would like to share, uh, share in my chat is that the USP, the United States Pharmacopeia, we we have been developing monographs, the what we call quality monographs for many of these plants. And many of the plants mentioned in, in, in the presentation today are also in our priority list for development. And together with this monograph, we also um elaborate what we call a mission and evaluation report. And these reports will contain toxicology information and also potential health effects and cautionary statements, which I think could be very valuable for these, you know, practitioners that are afraid, you know, um, they don't know exactly, you know, how to use the plant or the possible toxic adverse effects associated with the plant. So I put there my we're losing you, Maria, My but email, I will make sure that Dr. Vanderbrook gets your email. I see that it's in the chat, and I think we're really we're we're well over time. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Vanderbrook for a fabulous presentation, and all of you for your for joining us for your questions. I will make sure she gets the chat and. Before we leave, um, she did put her email in the chat for those of you whose questions were not answered who have follow-on questions from her. 
So thank you so much, Ina. Thank you, everybody. We hope to see you next month for Dr. Pando's presentation, which I think will also be wonderful. So um, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And, and feel free to reach out by email. And thank you, uh, Maria. I would love to talk some more with you. I will make sure you get her email address as well. Barbara, thank you so much for- Thank you. Hasta luego. Hasta luego a todos.